Christopher here. Welcome to another unique time hop. A couple weeks ago, I posted an old recording from Denver Starfest that kind of tied in really well with uh, the theme of the episode that was upcoming, which was Star Trek 2009. Hope you had a chance to go listen to both of those. Well, this time, our main episode is going to be on Watchmen, which is obviously an adaptation of the graphic novel. Well, as it happens, I did a panel at Denver Starfest back in 2013 about adaptations, bringing print to screen. So, I don't know, I figured I'd throw that in here too. Typical warning with any of these things, it was recorded in a big room, the audio is a little, you know, up and down. I think you'll still get the gist. So I hope you enjoy, and uh, we'll be back in a week with Watchmen. All right, welcome to the Denver Starfest 2013 from the printed page to the flickering screen panel. My name is Christopher. I'm with the Time Shifters podcast and John, uh, part of the Johnja.net family of podcasts, all two of them. Orphan Entertainment, if I can just plug that one real quick, is one of my other podcasts, and that is a podcast where we're kind of digging through and exploring films and radio and such of public domain. There's a lot of really neat stuff that have fallen just have just because of age or because people just didn't care about it, are now free and for everyone to read and listen and watch. So we like to kind of pick one out once a month and start reviewing those. But this panel is not about public domain, although kind of maybe is a little bit, because the, the idea is talking about adaptations from printed materials to the screen, whether it be television or movie. And this is something that's been done uh, since the moving picture started. Uh, some of the earliest silent pictures, I've, certainly that were uh, kind of genre-related, were things like Frankenstein and uh, First Men in the Moon, that sort of thing. And I think we can all agree that over the years, these adaptations, some have been really good. We've really enjoyed them. And others, we've, we went, why did you do that to my favorite book? Um, <laughs> so I thought we would just kind of discuss and talk about, you know, what goes... What happens to these things? Why do you think they make the changes that they do? And this is all uh, just from a fan's perspective. Uh, I was hoping to have a, 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 an expert in with me. Again, this panel just sort of, I think the 9 a.m. Uh, start time sort of uh, made a lot of things kind of fall apart. Uh, so I do apologize. So this is really going to be a little uh, slipshot here. So, <laughs> so this is all going to be from a fan's perspective. Uh, but, you know, hey, we're all fans. And that, the, the fans are the ones that go see the movies. Uh, we're the ones that pay the bills for these uh, studios and stuff. So why shouldn't it be our perspective? Uh, we should have a, a say and a little bit of criticism on the matter. So let's talk about just uh, real generally about what goes into when they uh, make these adaptations. I mean, there's obviously going to have to be a little bit of editing. Uh, you know, the, the, what we see in the movie theater is abridged to what is often in the, in the book. Um, but I think we've all kind of went, oh, why wasn't that scene in there? Uh, this is a, and let me remind you, too, this is an interactive panel. I mean, I want your opinions, and I want your thoughts. So anytime you, have, you guys have anything to say, throw your hands up, if, and uh, I'll, of course, throw out some questions. And then just, yeah, throw your hands up and let me get to you with the mic so I can make sure to hear you. I already got a hand. I love it. All the way in the back, of course. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm a writer. Um, I, I've done some adapting. Um, finding out the difference between what you, what you write in a fiction, as, as a fiction work and what you write as a screenplay is sort of... Um, where the fundamental differences begin in genre. And so I, I'm wondering if we could chat about that a little bit. Sure, did you have any uh, specifics in, in, in mind or any uh, on the topic? Well, an, an, an example that jumps to mind for me that isn't a sci-fi example, but um, uh, is an example of a, an adaptation of, of something that's out in public domain is uh, Talented Mr. Ripley. Uh, I, I felt like that was an excellent adaptation of the novel because the, the themes of the novel came through in the film, but I also feel like the film stood on its own because it used factors in film like cinematography, costuming, to evoke some of those senses that you get when you read the written page but can come at you sort of instantaneously through film. Uh, like the moment when he was talking in the mirror to himself. 
um, or the moment when uh, they were riding the Vespa through the streets of Italy. All right, very good. Yeah, no, let me be clear. I don't want this to be like a uh, let's let's bash the screenwriters panel or anything like that. I know that what they are doing. Yeah, oh, disappointing. No, I, I know what they're doing is an incredible task, and it's one of those things that you know is thankless because someone isn't going to like what you did. Uh, regardless of how good the film is, you, you know, there's always going to be someone that's going to come in and say, "Oh, but you left out my favorite part." Uh, so, yeah, the, I, I don't want this to turn into, and I didn't expect it to be any kind of um, a, a, a bash the writer or anything like that. But I mean, there are times. Yes, sir. Well, I, no. <laughs> I just want to hold it. Okay. Um, I, I think that especially when you're dealing with public domain stuff, the problem that you run into is that. The time period is, what, 75 years, and there's a, a, going to be a, a cultural disconnect there that may need some updating. So I don't, I don't know necessarily that the adapters are trying to completely, you know, kill the project. They're just they're trying to kill the work. They're just, they want to make it more relevant or up, up to date. And sometimes it, it's just, I mean, that the time for that particular work may have passed, and they're trying to do the best they can with it. <clears throat> John Carter kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So, so there's there's a yeah, that, that, you're right. Yes, there is. Uh, you have to update things to keep it to try to fit it into a current times. Um, something that was written in the late 1800s is going to have a lot of themes aren't going to hold up uh, to a 21st century audience. Uh, that is true of definitely the older stuff. But of course, there's lots of adaptations that are more recent. Uh, which can be just sometimes it's the most popular thing, and so the studio wants to you know cash in on what they can maybe and and and, and bring it to a, a larger audience, and so they they, uh, they do a film adaptation, thinking things like you know Hunger Games or, or or Twilight or you know any number of those, or even go back you know Jurassic Park. Uh, Jurassic Park was actually one that I felt was you know for the time and everything I thought it was a great ad- adaptation of the book. No, you couldn't fit everything that was in that book. That's we got to remember. You you pick up some of these books; they're how thick, you know. A typical screenplay, probably not even as thick as that book. <laughs> you can't fit it all. And sometimes with something like, especially in the genre, you know, you can imagine it and you can put it on paper, but being able to put it on screen again, you get the uh, issue with it, what can you do with it at the time. What's the ratio? I mean, the, at one point I know it was said that. Uh, I, a page of of uh, screenplay is worth a minute of screen time, but I know it, it's not not really that necessarily anymore. It's still a true. Is it about? It's about that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're looking at you know if you're taking a 350 page novel and condensing it into an into a 122 or 120 page manuscript. I mean you're you're going to have to try to keep only everything that drives the plot. But at the same time, there's the possibility of uplifting those things that were in there that maybe were a bit more turgid, like, say, Umberto Eco's In the Name of the Rose. The book itself is is fairly ponderous, but it it moves forward very well. I mean, mostly making Franciscan monks into Scottish people is probably fine, too. (laughs) You know... (laughs) I, I like Scottish people as as Russian submarine captains as well. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah that's a, and that, that's actually a, a film that I really enjoy. The Name of the Rose. Yeah, uh, the, uh, I've not, I have not read the original, you know, the the novel or anything that was based off, but it's, it, it's a movie I really enjoy. The movie is much. It's much more gripping. Yes. Okay. Well, if you're talking about um, um, a book that has a lot of descriptive qualities, you know, like say for example, this is an old example, but um, How Green Was My Valley. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a lot of stuff in there that was a description of the countryside, a description of the grinding poverty of the people and all of that. And visually, you can do that in seconds. Right, yeah. You know, so so there's a playback there. But if it's something that's really dialogue intensive and you're, you're you know, getting at little things and you're all sitting in one room and there's nothing you can do with that, then that's going to be a lot harder. It's your David Mamet, maybe. You can do that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then on on that question, there's there's a question of um, what are the creators trying to do in terms of faithfulness towards the original work? Um, sometimes you have a very loose adaptation, um, and sometimes you have a, a drive to be a very to do for a very strict adaptation. Um, a Lord of the Rings is obviously one of the big big examples, but um, here's a here's another one. Has anybody seen Atlas Shrugged? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Two people. That's that's kind of scary. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it's on the list. I apologize. <laughs> well, I mean, Atlas Shrugged. That 
that movie, the, those movies are ideologically intended to be as you know close to the book as possible, to the point where they're probably actually going to do the entire three hour speech in the, la- in the last movie. Basically. Oh, <laughs> they gotta. I mean, it's it's like otherwise the ghost of Anne Rand will come up and eat their soul or something. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so there's so there's a question there. I mean, is how how faithful is you? What am I trying to say? I don't know. I, I guess I just made my point. Yeah, I think oh, yeah, you, know, you made a fine point, and yeah, I do the same thing. I, I start, I start, and start, and start, and then I think, what was I trying to say? <laughs> I hope I said it. Yeah, I hope I said it. Um, well, I think one of uh, one of the big uh, issues with with um, adaptation is how uh, something that really plays into it is how big the fan base is. Um, you know, if you have something like you know Harry Potter, obviously, or Twilight or Hunger Games, um, maybe not so Twilight. Uh, <laughs> you have, you know, especially um, Harry Potter and the Hunger Games. There's so many little things in those books that, you know, to one person might not seem so important, but like to another, you know, Harry Potter fan or, or Hunger Games fan, is one of their favorite parts. Like Spew from Harry Potter wasn't in the movies, and people got so upset about it um, or Hermione's dress was not periwinkle and everyone got so upset about it um, where in reality you know you look at um, some of the little details and uh, when it comes to uh, you know making more people I mean movies make more people aware of the books just by you know people go and see the movies unfortunately people don't read as much as they as they watch movies because it's easier to just sit back and watch a movie uh, guilty and <laughs> guilty uh, and um i think that movies do a great job of making people aware of these amazing stories and so i think what sometimes fans forget is that the important thing is to you know have people fall in love with the book as much as you have. You know, they'll see the movie and they'll go and they'll read the book. Or even if they don't read the book, they see this amazing story and sometimes maybe they'll miss a few things, but the story's still there and it's still just as important. Um, so I think that's sort of a, an issue of like, well, do we want to, uh, uh, like, you know, make the fans happy or do we want to promote this amazing story and unfortunately have to skimp on a few details, you know? Um, so I don't know. It's, I, I'm a screenwriter myself, and it, it's hard. To, <laughs> I've been, you know, tr- I've think I've been thinking about writing, you know, a couple of adaptations, fan adaptations of some of my favorite books, and I'm like, oh, oh god! Every time I write a page, I'm like, that's a minute. Oh god! <laughs> I have so much. That's a minute. <laughs> my, my five hour screenplay. So where do you land on the continuum when it comes to? Because if you look at like Chris Columbus in the book, in the first book of Harry Potter. You know, he, he was religious in terms of how he was trying to be so very faithful. And you contrast that with Alphonse Cuaron in the third movie, which was so much more trying to make more of an artistic statement. Where, where do you land on that continuum? Because that's all still within the same movie universe. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm a diehard Harry Potter fan. Um, and I, I feel like, you know, I love, I love the first few movies because they were so faithful, you know, um, because they tried to keep as much in it. And once it got to the third, and especially the fourth, um, it, it was, I, I, sometimes, you know, I, I, me and my friends were a little disappointed because, you know, they left out some things that were really close to our hearts. But I think um, what the directors and the writers were faced with was, was that the first few books were much smaller and so there wasn't I mean there wasn't quite as much you know um, to they, they could put more details in and keep it at a sh- uh, you know an, an hour or uh, not an hour geez, um, two hours uh, or less you know um, and but when it start once you got to third and fourth and Obviously, I mean, they had to split the last book into two movies. I think that speaks for itself. Um, they still had things that were left out. Um, 
that that was definitely that plays into it because you know the smaller the book is, the less minutes <laughs> that you have to worry about. Well, I mean, you know, when when you're talking about stuff like uh, Deathly, you know, Deathly Hallows one and two, or yeah. um, Twilight Breaking Dawn one and two, and the book did not need to be two. No, but neither did. <laughs> but you know, but really neither did Deathly Hallows. I mean, you could if you were if you were willing to. You know, to to take the bullet, you could have condensed Deathly Hallows into one movie. There was one movie's worth of plot there. Yeah. Um, why they didn't was well, first of all, it was a financial decision because people go to see Harry Potter movies and they think yes. they are <laughs> they are ridiculously profitable. So therefore, you know, the more, more profitable, bo- yeah, yeah, they will. The more Harry Potter movies, the better. But at the same time, they're trying to please the fans because they know the fans want to see everything in the last book because that's where everything comes together. And it's the last one. Yeah, exactly. So having <laughs> one more to just sort of weed Until the prequel. off. Yeah. Yep. Is that a prequel? Yeah. See some hands raised down here? Any comments? I was just going to bring up the size of the source material you were talking about there. I mean, the first book is, what, 200 pages mm-hmm. and big print? And then the third book was more like 900 I mean, so right there, and then the last book, nearly a thousand, or whatever, whatever it was. I mean, the size, it's huge change. Yes, uh, that's true. Uh, it, maybe that's a little bit something that happens, especially with these, uh, where they do the adaptations of series, like something like Harry Potter's or Lord of the Rings, where a lot of times it starts out, like, I'm sure when she started out Harry Potter, oh, great, here's this little, cute little book, and here's another little book, you know, and then suddenly there's this huge fandom group about it, and it's like, oh, well, I need to give these audiences more, and so by the end, you have these giant books, and then someone comes in, oh, we want to make a movie. I'm like, yeah, good luck with that, yeah. Uh, I also wonder if you're saying how early on they were trying so hard to be as faithful as they could to it, and then by the end they started uh, waving their hand a little bit more and got a little more fuzzy on the details. Do you think there's any um, factors in there about the fandom was incredibly hot when it started, and I'm, saying, I'm not saying the fandom dipped a, a lot, but the fact that the fandom probably started dipping a little by the time you finally get to those final movies, do you think, well, we've got less fans to please? Do you think that, that, that ever comes into play? I'll have to ask Harry Potter down, the Harry Potter fan down here real quick. I don't, I don't know. I don't think that that comes into play a lot just because, you know, it, it, I think that, especially, I mean, with Harry Potter especially, I, I don't know about, you know, Hunger Games is obviously not over yet. Um, thank God. Uh, <laughs> but um, with any series that's ending, um, when it comes to that end, it, the excitement and obviously the nostalgia and all just the fan activity goes up so much mm-hmm. that even if, like, I think it accommodates. Um, and so I think that. Yeah, the directors maybe might have felt, oh, well, you know, it's sort of... Well, let me put it this way. Do you think the fandom shifted a little bit where suddenly you had a larger fan base of the films versus the oh. fan base of the books? Let me let me put it that way. I think... Where then it becomes a little less important to be as faithful to the books because you're yeah. just trying to please the people that are coming to see the movies. I don't... I, don't, I think with, with Harry Potter, I don't, I don't think that... Yeah, that may not be the best yeah. example, but it is, I mean, it is one that I could I think thought, think the, of that had a lot of books. Yeah. And, yeah, I think it depends on the book. If if there is if there's a series that is finished um, before the movie comes out, or finished, you know, some almost finished before the first movie comes out, then I think it becomes more of okay, it's uh, we want to please the people who are fans of the movies because you know they're not as like excited about the book because there isn't a new book coming out, so why not? Right. Yeah, well, remind me of the timeline. Wasn't uh, she still writing like the last book or two when oh, they were yeah. films were being? Yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah, no, it, um, they were. The movies were generally, I think, two. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think there were two book, uh, two movies behind the books that she was writing. So um, I think because you know you'd see the movie and then like for the last book uh, um, they had. Uh, I believe it was Goblet of Fire, maybe. Um, they had that movie come out. Um, it was Prisoner was of it Prisoner? Azkaban? It was Prison, Prisoner of Azkaban was the last movie to come out. Was the movie out uh, around the time of um, the last book? Of the last. Okay, yeah. Thank you for yeah. So, um, 
when President of, uh, not President, jeez, <laughs> I am tired, I do not have my coffee, um, <laughs> when that movie came out, um, they made it come out specific, when they found out when um, uh, the uh, last Harry Potter book was going to come out, and that whole fiasco happened, um, I was just reading Harry history, and she was talking about this, um, that they sort of pushed up the premiere to come out, I think, like a month before the uh, the last book did. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and so there was, there, there's definitely a conversation there. Um, and I, I think that when it comes to longer books, as long as there are still books coming out, then I think you've got half and half there where there's, the movie fans and there's the Harry Potter the you know book fans Person. and those mesh a lot you know people sure. are like oh I saw the the movie this was amazing I should go read the other books you know yeah. I should oh, I know stay ahead of, of the fandom yeah. you know mm-hmm. or I should get a sneak pre- peek of what the movies are going to be you know so um, you can also clip the source material too without the screen if you yeah. Yeah, a prime example would be like Dexter I mean, yeah. Dexter went in I mean you read the books of Dexter and this guy's sort of Semi incompetent, and and then you look at the the way that uh, uh, Michael C. Hall is is playing it, and the way that it's written, it's much, it's so different, and and many of the, some of the characters died that that uh, survived in in both realms. Uh, I think the same way with True Blood too, um, where the the screen actually outstrips what I mean, and there is that possibility, but then you also take that risk that you're going to alienate the original fan base when you when you go to do that. But mm-hmm. if you can elevate it. Isn't that your kind of duty as a writer to sort of elevate the material to a point where it's, it even makes it better? better? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I <laughs> the, honestly come to mind the, uh, the Walking Dead too. I mean, we're just talking uh, uh, the, uh, the graphic novels versus the television show are two completely different universes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the fan base with Harry Potter is a little bit different because you okay. you can grow a new fan base as you go because the people that were five years old when the first one came out. You know, aren't going to grok the movie, but you know, three or four years later, when it's still a big thing, they're going to start at the beginning and they're going to follow it along, and then the one that was four years old is going to catch up. And you know, so it's not the same as having an adult audience having the same, you know, uh, universe around. You know, the adults might um, kind of spin out sooner and give up on it. You know, whereas the kids are still coming in because that's such an attractive thing for the kids. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I've, uh, I'll admit, I said, you know, guilty, I, I watch a lot more movies than I do read books, unfortunately, a lot of a time crunch and everything, but there has been several movies that did draw me to the books, so I have gone the other way. Exactly, that actually brings up my point, is, you know, the books and movies are completely different subject matters, and you're going to have different fans for each. For me, in my past experience, what actually draws me into wanting to go read the book is how well they adapted the movies. Take Dune, for example. The movie, you know, David Lynch version while missing tons of the book, had the great tone to make me excited to actually go read this giant book as a child. Instead of, you know, I would never pick it up. The BBC version, while true to a lot of the details, they added a lot of embellishments. So the acting wasn't good, costuming wasn't good, and you're like, I don't want to read that book. <laughs> Whereas Lord of the Rings trilogy was the same thing. I tried the books as a kid, hated them, couldn't get very past them, then watched the movies, thought they were fantastic, went back and finally read the books. And John Carter was the same thing. I, I loved the movie. Yeah, they didn't do the greatest job. There was a lot of things to it. They changed some stuff. But, I mean, if you read the books, he gets to Mars by looking at Mars, and then he's on Mars. <laughs> that, you can't translate that to a movie. You can't go, and he's on Mars. So they had to develop some things and, you know, a plausible character driven to get to that point. And, you know, Deja Thoris in the books is like, oh, hi, I'm the princess great <laughs> it's like i'm not going to read that so i went back and read the whole series of john carter after watching the sci-fi channel came up with an adaptation of it was miserable after watching that my dad was so excited he called me and said the books i kept telling you to read there's now watch the movie i watched the movie and went never ever ever will i read the book never so luckily you know as much as people hate the disney version the disney version made me read the books i was so excited and i loved every book and I would have never gotten there. Sometimes, though, the adaptation does detract from, uh, you know, from the from the source material. I mean, take John Carter for example. In the books, everybody's naked. 
Yeah. And well, you, you know, and that that's a thing. You know, and you can't really do that on. Uh, you, you can't really do that in, in a movie editor. Really, you think? <laughs> yeah. But the whole the tone of the movie and the sense, you know, the sense of the books is where you're trying to go with the feel for it to make you go back and want to read the books and then really see where the source material was. Yeah. And that's the point to the movie. It's good as I mean. John Carter is great as far as setting the groundworks and the structure for being a fan. And, and you know, like what Tarzan is, is, is also wonderful. But I think the only problem with John Carter, it's, it's again, because it's, it's, it's not, I think now it's a public domain work, isn't it? Uh, the original John Carter, yeah. yes. Yeah. And it's just the problem is, is that there have been so many riffs and changes to that genre that the superhero has gone so much farther to take it back and it's like oh yeah he's amazing he jumps he does and nope he just jumps yeah oh that could be good 20 minutes yeah, my, my big you know John Carter has a lot of problems or it, or it had a lot of problems in its production but almost none of them are actually applicable to you know the adaptation Which of the work the original and to know where it came from is so valuable it's just that everything seemed to have yeah, move forward from that point. And it's kind of like it's hard to go back and for for the film audience to go back and see the value of that character. Then. That's a rough one. I think things like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings. I think you, well, maybe Lord of the Rings. That might be a little fuzzy, but definitely like things like Harry Potter and you know, the Twilights or whatever. A little easier to take for the audience. Uh, yeah, going all the way back, you know, two hundred years to <laughs> John Carter, another story. You brought, you brought up one thing that really bugs me about film adaptations is they need to trust the audience better. You were talking about you can't just get him to Mars by him looking at Mars. I say, why not? You know, why not take that just, yeah, who knows how he got here? Trust the audience to just sort of go along with the ride. You know, no, you didn't have to have the, you know, Sauron actually come out and go do a sword battle with, with Aragorn. I'm glad Peter Jackson Jackson did ditch that idea. But, you know, did he need to add in the Nazgul shattering Gandalf staff? I mean, come on, that was a total violation in the third movie there. <laughs> Let me get a point back here. Uh, one other thing with John Carter was that so many of the elements of the book had already been done in myriad of other uh, movies over the years, and they thought it was a rehash, not realizing that all those elements had originally come from John Carter. Yeah, I was just going to bring that up. That was my biggest gripe of almost all the criticisms that I read of John Carter. Like, oh, it's just a copycat of Superman and Star Wars. I'm like, did you actually ever look at the date that this thing was written? <laughs> you know, come on. Biggest gripe I had on that. I, I love that movie. I saw the movie in the theater. I was so thrilled I saw it in the theater. I thought it was a brilliant movie. I couldn't say more good things about it than I did. Everyone I went and saw it with loved it. People I talked to, I loved it. For some reason, all the papers and the critics hated it. I'm like, what movie did you see? Did they go? Did they get some special screening of the Sci-Fi Channel one? And did, you know, <laughs> no one told them. And that's actually one. That was an adaptation that I thought was fine. I think what they changed. I was okay with. I went back and read the read John Carter of Mars after I saw the movie because I was curious to see what they had done, and I thought it was fine. I didn't mind any of the changes or the updates. I didn't sit there and go, "Oh, they shouldn't have done that." I, I was fine with that change, with the changes they made. I was fine with the um, space clerics or whatever they were, the with the medallions. I mean, but you're in a different you're in a different strata. <laughs> you're. There, there are the people who are here, mm -hmm. and these are people who care about the history of science fiction and, and how everything is developed. And, uh, and then there are those who it's like, oh, that might be one flavor. Science fiction is one flavor of something they take now and again with some other things that they like. And the people that will care about it, I mean, I think, yeah, a lot of people, I, I liked it. I liked it a lot. <laughs> But I know my friends who have sort of a, a very tangential relationship with science fiction just didn't didn't appreciate it because it was more for that core base, I think, mm -hmm. to know where it came from. It's like, yeah, Edgar Rice bro, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, that's the master. It's where it all began. It's like, yeah, H.G. Wells, yes, that's perfect. But for them, it's like, oh, that's old. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's not where we're at. And so, yeah. Yeah, uh, one adaptation, I remember, well, you want to call it a, a re-adaptation or a remake, was the uh, 
the Tom Cruise War of the Worlds. Yes. Didn't care for. I mean, I will go back and watch the George Powell. What, George Powell, is that right? Yeah, Got the one, that one? Okay. I'll go back and watch the George Powell version over and over and over again, even though it is probably further removed from the source material than the Tom Cruise version. I didn't like the Tom Cruise version. How about Tiana's version of the David? The movie that shall not be named. <laughs> and <there it> is. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is probably a little bit off topic, but when we finish with this one, I want to talk about this one, and it has to do with the comment about that's the old stuff. I, I am one of those people who was a big fan of Dickens and various other folks, and you really had to work to read, you know. <laughs> but um, um, I want to talk about a little bit about the graphic novels because I have a problem with graphic novels. <laughs> We can go go ahead. Did, did, did anyone have anyone else any other points they wanted to make on the subject of the, the John Carter's or the movie that shall not be named? <laughs> well, I think the uh, the John Carter is a a good example of the lean way of adapting it and where you're adapting it to on the film. I mean the the TV series versus the movie. Like if you're adapting something to one TV series and where it's broadcasting versus if it's going into a movie, like the Game of Thrones series being on HBO and having this huge time to actually explain everything versus like Lord of the Rings getting cut into like three and a half four hours per book, and just the the amount that you can translate it where to, and then you take things like the Goodkin series when they tried and failed horribly to adapt it to the seeker truth. Um, <laughs> it, it was an awful attempt, and what it was was uh, I think they chose the wrong medium because it was on a, a public regular TV station, and if they'd done something like an HBO or a Showtime, Showtime. they could have gotten away with more and been able to put more into it. I don't but know. I, I read the Good Kinda books, and I think they got exactly the the, um, the adaptation they deserved. <laughs> oh, wow. 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 Oh, <laughs> Yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's shift a little bit into the graphic novels. I brought up The Walking Dead a little bit ago, and that's, that's definitely as hot as The Walking Dead is right now. We got Melissa McBride downstairs for one thing. Um, you know, definitely uh, worth mentioning. So, well, to me, it's it, uh, there's sort of a cheat. I mean, in 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 some sense, you, you have two problems. The first problem is I, I I'm actually. Uh, uh, painter by profession so you know I, I started out doing all the visual stuff and there's something that grinds me about having this is how it looks I mean a movie does the same thing but but a graphic novel is is more um, it's more strident it's more black and white it's it it's it kind of hardens your mind into it and your imagination mm-hmm. goes okay. away you know, um, so it's that and plus you lose all the text and you lose all the descriptions and the graphic is not usually enough to fill the gap. Have you have you ever seen Kurt Busiek's Conan series that he did the graphic novels of? I think it was Kurt Busiek. Um, it is it takes Robert E. Howard's lines and fills in the gaps with with beautiful paint and beautiful characters and whatnot. And it is a storyboarded movie that is is a million times better than the Schwarzenegger version. And 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 then you know honestly I thought. The, like the Jason Momoa version actually really came closer to encapsulating what Howard was doing with the short stories. But they are these beautiful storyboards that that they they really they take that extra step that maybe you're maybe you're not maybe your mind isn't ready to take or something like that to to say, Oh, this is what this could have been. And I, guess, I guess my problem is I, I, I started out with my, my idea of the predecessor of the graphic novel is those old little Star Trek books that had the little bubbles with the... Okay. <laughs> you know, they had the photos and the little bubbles with the talk and... Sure. Oh, gotcha. Sure. Well, I mean, that argument, the idea that, you know, a graphic novel can take a story and because, because you're adding the pictures, you're eliminating that aspect of your imagination. Is that what you yeah. were saying? Well, that same argument can be said about any movie adaptation, too. If you're, you're showing the pictures, you're showing it, there's your imagination. You don't need to think about and use your imagination about, oh, what, what does this look like? Because it, someone else has done it for right. you. Um, and that's where, but honestly, though, I think that can help. Like I said, I've gone to some movies and then gone back to their source material to try to see where they've come from and everything. And sometimes, especially when you're dealing with some older novels or stories, I think it kind of helps to have that image in your head that you can sort of place in there because sometimes the the language or the descriptions, they might be describing something that hasn't existed in a hundred years. You know, you don't... I think sometimes it helps to have 
those images in your head or that characterization in your head when you go back to those to just sort of help help you understand the, the source material? I think um, I think it's really difficult uh, to take um, a movie or or a, or a, a book and turn it into a graphic novel. Um, I think people who do it well should really be applauded because it's diff- it's extremely difficult because you know you s- people especially not even just to you know make it good but to get people to buy it and to to want to see it because a lot of the, I I mean I've had I've been guilty of this myself you know I'll walk into a comic book store and I'll see like you know a Star Trek comic or a Doctor Who comic and I'm like uh, <laughs> <laughs> like uh like, don't get me wrong, I'm a fan of fan fiction, but this is just weird. Um, like, sometimes it's sort of like, I just, you know. But um, there are really amazing uh, graphic adaptations of, of of stories that we've already come to know and love, and I think it's just, like, when it comes to making a book into a movie, you know, obviously there is writing there that goes to um, the writing and the screenplay. Um but when it comes to a book, to a graphic novel, obviously there's writing there, but it's it's I think it's more difficult because obviously there's it's harder to be like oh this is you know the description like you have to take it and you have to really be able to take the imagery that's in a book and put it to that and depending on the book there might not be as much imagery. Um, that it you know it might be more when it's more dialogue based you're like okay what do these characters look like how do I make this believable? But, but graphic novels are storyboarded the exact same way as films are in many cases. Right. And they're able to take, but it's they're also able to take time and change time and show different ways that time is expressed in terms of a graphic novel like you might have someone who is you know you'll see a you'll see a punch come back but you won't necessarily see the punch land but you know that it did because you see the results of that later on like uh, i don't know if you've read the book scott mccloud's understanding comics but it's a really i mean it's fascinating and it, it takes in all of the things that the graphic novel can do is is pretty magical and it is a, a nice large stride towards the text which is only your imagination and the literal visual truth of the film, it's a wonderful intermediary step that still has you playing. You need to fill in the blanks with your, with your mind as well. Um, I, I think that's definitely something that needs to be considered. So. Anybody else have any points on that? Well, it's just uh, when you're looking at those kind of adaptations, each one's going to speak to a different audience and a different part of your imagination as well. And I think a great example of that was The Stand, because Stephen King's The Stand, you have all three adaptations available, and all three speak to you differently as you're taking them in. And, I mean, you can put different things into the graphic novel that you can versus into the film, and you you get different feels out of it each way. So. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, uh, a, a fan of one is not necessarily going to be a fan of another, or you know, maybe someone will be a fan of two of them. Uh, I was just thinking of ap- adaptations of graphic novels to movies, like Frank Miller, you know, 300. Um, Sin City. Sin City. Yes, yeah. You know, where the visual style in the graphic novel... And Sin City's beautiful. I mean, it was so influenced by the art mm-hmm. that he pulled into it. I, I think that's what was, uh, really helped that. That's why I love Sin City so much, is because it was this, it was uh, like moving pictures from the grip. I, it's hard to describe. Frank Miller was also given a co-director credit right. on mm-hmm. that one yeah. because of the storyboarding. Yeah, no, I really loved it because it was so artistic. Yeah, but like the, the colors, the they, they lit, I, I like The Watchmen, honestly, yeah. I get that, I mean, your point over there, that, Comics and graphic novels are very different. I mean, they're they're written very differently. They're pictured very differently. So when you're talking about the Star Trek thing, that's a comic. And, yeah, they don't adapt well. They're fun. It's great for kids to get into and want to read and get into wanting to art and read and start reading. They would, you know, finally maybe hopefully read books. But it's a great place to start. But graphic novels are very, very different. They really are about the imagery of you see the picture and then you can imagine more and go more with that and they have better writing in the small writing that they have in it and it is they 
they adapt very well into movies because they start visually and then they move more into a movie. They're not trying to make it from a book. Those don't come across so well. But then I want them to bring back miniseries. HBO and Showtime are doing a good job of some of that, but miniseries is it's a great way of actually putting in a book under instead of your two-hour movie. Yeah, Under the Dome is coming Dome. out uh, June, I think. Um, yeah. Apparently, I heard uh, just recently that apparently they're going to remake the Shogun miniseries. The original Shogun miniseries is just absolutely phenomenal, which, of course, makes whenever they tag on the word remake to something that makes me a little nervous. I'm trying I'm trying so hard to keep an open mind on remakes. Reboot yeah they all say reimagining. Reimagining's the new one. I think that's the one that kind of, that I that I use so I can sort of uh, swallow it a little better. Someone mentioned um well someone mentioned the movie that shall not be named. But the original The Day the Earth Stood Still. I'll name that one. Now have, has anybody read Farewell to the Master of which that was based? Anybody? No. Interesting. Farewell to the Master. This was a real interesting one because there are just little bits and pieces in that short. It's a short story. It's only you know a dozen, about two dozen pages. It's not that long, and there's only just when you watch the movie, you read the the, the, the short story. There's just little elements within the short story that appear within the movie. And so I, it really falls down to that. You almost wonder if it was the, okay, we've got this movie, and it's a lot like this, so maybe we better make sure we buy the rights. <laughs> you know, just to make sure. <laughs> uh, there is a giant robot. There is a spaceship that lands. And, uh, and really, that's about it. Uh, I don't even think the robot's not, e- it's not even called Gort. He has some different name. Um, and, uh, and the end is similar, but it's a real interesting um, I would really recommend it. It's a short read. Like I said, it's only maybe two dozen pages. It's a real short story. Farewell to the Master. Farewell to the Master. And uh, and it's public domain, so you can find it easy. And it's just, as far as um, I'm trying to put my words that are in my head actually out of my mouth, sorry. (laughs) It's a real neat uh, look at how some things are adapted just based on, hey, this is a really great idea. Let's see what we can do with it and expound on it. And they did a really brilliant job with the uh, with the original film, and as I understand it, the second film, not so much. So, <laughs> whoa, I'm clad too. <laughs> what is that? How much time do we got? I know we're kind of we started a few minutes late. We got about ten minutes. Okay. Does anybody have anything else they wanted to bring up? I'm kind of. Yeah. Sure. This is this is kind of an outlier. Um. How many how many anime fans in the audience? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, cool. Right. Well, I mean, how many of you have actually read any of the manga that some of the most popular anime are available? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that's an interesting that's an interesting situation because a lot of times when a manga is adapted into an anime, usually it's done midstream. It starts with the first couple dozen chapters of you know of the manga and then it catches up to where the creator is but the creator is running on a weekly schedule or a monthly schedule and they can't actually keep re- making content for it and so you get wildly divergent stuff in a lot of anime a good example um full metal alchemist was a tv series and it got to about the first i want to say first third of the pl- of of the plot of the of the manga which only just finished this started like 15 years ago and it um and they didn't have any more chapters to adapt so they went their own direction and it was it was absolutely brilliant in a way but um yeah you know, so i mean there there's there's that adapta- there's that thing in the adaptation where you've got your um Creator, where, where the creators sort of on on the one adaptation sort of outstrip the creators of the main work, which I think you see in Walking Dead because that's mm-hmm. also an ongoing um, comic series. Right, as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah uh, Walking Dead is a, a, I've been so scared to read the books uh, because I didn't want any spoilers. And but then uh, Melissa McBride, McBride was coming to Starfest. I was like, well, I'm kind of curious. What was her? What's Carol like in the book? So I started doing just a little wiki research and things like that and everything. And I'm reading about her and I'm reading the situations that she's in. And it's like, that's not Carol. Yeah, that's not the Carol I know. I'm thinking, you know what? I think it's okay to go read the books because it's a whole nother universe. And do you have uh, Rick has is 
in the in the, in the uh, comics is lost a hand, which is something that Kirkman actually talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago on the Talking Dead. He said, "Man, I wish I hadn't done that." Because in the comics, you'll see Rick. It's like, well, what's Rick doing right now? It's like, well, he's buttoning his shirt. No, he's not buttoning his shirt because he only has one hand. And it's like, oh, he's going to open up this can. It's like, no. Nope, nope. And I have to have a, I have to include another panel in the comic to hand the can to another person to open for Rick, which is kind of interesting of the changes he made. And then um, I don't want to spoil anything. So okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure I'll read it and there'll be something, but I won't know it's a spoiler until I actually see it on the series. So that's. I, I'm, I feel like I'm safe. Okay, one more down here. I'm going to, at the risk of getting myself in trouble with my mouth, I'm going to go back to the graphic novel for a minute. <laughs> um, I do book reviews, and um, it's one of the things that people have asked me to review, and I'm going. I don't know where to start. <laughs> so for for those of you who spend a lot of time with graphic novels, I need some tips. Ellen Moore. Ellen Moore. Ellen Moore. Yeah. Ellen, if you're, you're, what are, what are you looking for specifically in terms of? Are you, are you just looking for a? Place to start? Alan. Alan Moore. Yeah. Alan. Alan Moore. Not Ellen. Yeah, I said Ellen. I said Ellen. Alan. The Sandman series. Oh, yeah, very popular. He yeah. won the World Fantasy Award, and then after he won the World Fantasy Award, they exempted graphic novels to keep him out of it. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 amazing. It, it references. Shakespeare and mythology, yeah. and it's absolutely beautiful. And, and he's a lovely man if you ever get to meet him. He's the yeah, nicest he person. I like the graphic novels. I'm not a comic book fan. Oh, really? Superheroes, that yeah. stuff, it's, it's just not very good. Because I love reading books. That's why I'm with you. The comic books just don't have enough in there for me. But the graphic novels meet my expectations between movies and books yeah, to really enjoy Swamp the story. Thing. And then you go, oh, I want to see that on the screen. Oh, Swamp Thing, yeah. And part of the thing with graphic novels is if you get the wrong illustrator, you know, like um, I read Patterson's uh, Witch and Wizard graphic novel, and I didn't think that much of the art. So you need the artist to bring the art forward. Mm -hmm. It's kind of you know. like an audio book. Like if you have the wrong reader on a good, on a good book... The wrong reader can absolutely kill the book, but it can also. But the right reader can take something middling and make it truly extraordinary too. Yeah. Well, there's a part like I love Patricia Briggs, and her graphic novels are horrible. <laughs> and, it's like, and I mean, they're just trying to make money. Mm. You know, it's like the, the X Files or any adaption, uh, Jurassic Park by Tops. I mean, when they make them in the comics, they're just terrible. And you can also find. I think it's also important to find the graphic novels that are telling a story graphically that is right. is is limited there's one that's called stitches about this uh this kid that is getting surgery for cancer but does not know that because the parents didn't tell this child that they had cancer so they having they have these stitches and a whole story and imagination comes out of that there's another one about an artist who's dealing with her uh her depression within the context of this and it's not just guys and gals in tights although those are awesome <laughs> because i want to fly and yeah <laughs> so but you can find amazing stories that are well told within the graphic novel um, Softly Falling Snow is one that I think that just came out. I think that's the name of it. But there's so many of them that are, are just really great and well told that aren't just what you would consider comic books. They are full on stories that are graphically told and told. Strangers in Paradise, Strangers in Paradise is, yeah, amazing. Um, well, that's Keller fans. <laughs> Well, I think uh, we're running a little bit of, out of time, and of course we've we got another group coming in here shortly, and I don't know if they need to do any setup or anything like that, so we will call it quits. I want to thank you guys for a brilliant discussion. Uh, I, had, I had to talk so little, and that's what I love the best. So really, thank you very much for coming out this early. Uh, if you didn't get a cup of coffee and you want a cup of coffee, there's a whole lot still in here. Please help yourself uh, while it's still a little, bit of, still a little warm. Or else I'm going to drink it all, and you're going to find me. I'll, I'll be like the Flash. You're not going to be able to actually see me. You know. Uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, check out the Time Shifters podcast and Johnja.net. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. That was from the printed page of the flickering screen, recorded at Denver Starfest 2013. I want to thank everyone that participated in this panel. It was a fantastic discussion. Everyone really brought their A game, and I really appreciate it. 